from Matthew 18. I want to try to preach. I don't, I don't know if it's in a structured way at all, but a, f a few words on childlike faith. I want to say something about childlike faith. It may be more than a few words, but I hope words that are anointed here this morning. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, Except ye be, ye be converted and become as little children, ye cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. The text in our passage on childlike faith is where Jesus said, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of of heaven. Faith is belief in something or trust in some person. Now in the Bible, faith is primarily trust rather than belief. A matter of personal relationship rather than of abstract knowledge. You've heard me say that over and over and over again. The object of faith is God. And Jesus taught us to pray as we did in the Lord's Prayer or what really should be said, the model prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven. And I think this reveals that our attitude toward God must be the same as that of Jesus when He walked on earth, the attitude of a child. An interesting observation is that as I searched the Scriptures, I could find, at least at this point, no explicit example of childlike faith unless it would be that of the child Jesus in the temple at 12 or maybe Samuel of old. And yet even these examples seem to be more implicit than explicit. Faith is usually spoken of with reference to adults. Notice Hebrews 11. It has to do with the faith of the giants of the faith, both women and both and men, the mighty men of valor. Nevertheless, a study of the nature of faith reveals the necessity of childlikeness as the basic ingredient. Perhaps you, we should note then what our Lord was saying in our text because I believe it is the text for childlike faith. He said, in order to enter the kingdom of God, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, except you have faith, except you turn and have this change that pivots upon our faith in Him and become as little children. You see? Two things. Ye shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. So the two prerequisites are conversion or the, establ the establishment of faith and childlikeness, which is the result of of a childlike faith. Jesus says we cannot get into heaven without it. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking over for the moment that we must be converted and we must become. It seems like that whenever we get out of the childlikeness of being a child, we start toward adulthood and we start toward competency and we start toward in, uh, inter, not interdependence, but independence rather than dependence. And, and it's, it's the way of the world. And in spite of trying to teach our children what faith in God is like, they're going to be contaminated with something other than childlikeness. It is going to happen. So he says, now when you're converted, turn around and go the other way. Go back to childlikeness. Wasn't it good to be a child? It wasn't hard to be childlike. I'm sorry that, you know, we're all so childish 
that's because of the carnal nature, but there's also that good quality within us when we're children of childlikeness. Isn't it just wonderful to watch a child? It's wonderful to watch my daughter. It's wonderful to watch your children. And it's wonderful to watch that purity and that innocence and that dependence and all of these are qualities of childlikeness. But how tragic it is that we lose those qualities. This morning, a lot of what you're getting in everything and toward every person who was up here, including our pianist and our singer and all the rest of us, had to, had to depend on your childlikeness. And if you're childlike, then you just thought everybody was good to know. You thought that everything going on was good. Had no reason to think otherwise. Uh, and, and a child's like that. And as the songs are being sung, you're able to receive, whether they be high in uh, hymnody or, or whatever, in gospel song, medium or whatever, you, you were able to be so thankful and childlike and just say, oh, Jesus, that's what I need. It's simple trust and simple faith, as Bill Gaither wrote in, in the choir number here. But the more worldly adult that you were, the less you received in the service here this morning. And it's, it's the tragedy of uh, trying to worship Jesus. Oh, Jesus wants us to be childlike. And uh, he said we can't even get to heaven without it. I called Nancy, or Nancy called me this morning. She's still in bed, but you couldn't tell it by her voice. She said she wanted me to know that she was praying for me, and she wanted me to know that she loved me and that she loved us, Nancy Bradley, Omar's wife. And then I, see, I said, Nancy, I'm preaching on childlike faith this morning. You know what she said? She said, oh. She said, you mean taking God at His word and hanging on to His promises with everything you have? <laughs> I never told her I hung up the phone. But I said, thank you, Jesus, and I wrote it right down. <laughs> oh, glory to God. This woman, lovely wife of this precious man here, is really childlike. She didn't know she gave me a great theological definition, but she did. She just landed dead center. I thought it was about as good as anything. Taking God at His word and hang on to His promises with everything you have. Amen. That's what Nancy's doing over there with, with her legs hurting and these blood clots that are in her legs. That's what she's doing, Omar. She's taking God at His word and hanging on to His promises with everything that she has. See, it's, it's so beautiful. So, in her definition, we find with what I've said previously in the scripture text, characteristics that are a childlike faith. Now, without going to somebody's book, I thought I would just write down those things that would come to my mind and heart about a childlike faith. The first I remembered because of the verse after our text which said, Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The first quality is humility. Whosoever, therefore, shall humble himself as this little child. Humility is not knowledge of humility, but knowledge of one's dependence and knowledge of one's nothingness. Of course, our children don't know that they're humble. Sometimes they aren't when childishness shows up. But basically, they're humble. They have to be. They're just humble. Why? They, re they don't know everything. Daddy knows everything. They don't know how to cook. Mama knows how to cook. They can't get to school and back. The bus driver helps them do that. Everything they do, they're simply dependent on everybody else. See, They're really dependent upon God. How in the world can they be so happy and not know anything and be so nothing? And yet, the children are the happiest. The truth of the matter is you and I grow up and we lose the, the knowledge of our nothingness and the knowledge of our dependence and we lose our happiness. Because the truth of the matter is the child can see the home and the school life and the church life, but if you see the whole world and the whole kingdom and the whole universe, you'll find out that you're nothing and you'll find out that you're very depending 
de very dependent. And only in that knowledge does humility result. And happiness is also a result. So I think that humility is the first characteristic that comes to my mind. And how wonderful to see somebody so dependent upon Jesus. I don't know how humble I am. I'm all too aware that humility eludes me. Now I'm sincere now. I'm all too aware that as I grew up, I began to depend upon certain things. Certain background, certain confidences in education, certain of this and certain of that. But you know, as you start the path of obedience, God has a way of taking those props out from under you so that you return to childlikeness, that you, that you return to dependence. And if you try to walk the path of obedience, that cross will take all those props out until you're simply dependent on Jesus all over again. I really believe that Brother Ham is one of the most childlike and one of the most dependent persons upon Jesus I have ever seen. If you're with him in the prep time of preparation or whatever it is, you find out that he really is a man of dependence. God has taught us that, men. God has taught us that. That at least we're beginning to learn that. That our education isn't going to do it. Our personality isn't going to do it. And all the gifts, that's not going to do it. But only God is able to help us in this place today. To help us in this service. To help us in this lesson that we're having here this morning on childlikeness. Now I feel like that childlikeness is something like preaching on the blood and the cross. You aren't going to get it most likely. See, I can tell it when I started it. Now what I did, I broke that veil just a little bit when I said that. Because as sure as I start to preach on the blood of the cross, it's like I've got something in front of me. Oh, I can preach on something else and maybe run all over the place and have a good time because it brings enthusiasm and joy and entertainment. But when I start on this, the key, if you get this, see, if you get this, he said if they hear, they'll be saved. So they don't hear because they haven't met the conditions. Therefore, their hearing is blocked and they will not be saved. Now, when I'm telling you that, all at the same time, I'm telling you that in the hope that you and I will humble ourselves and will acknowledge our dependence upon Jesus and plead the blood of Jesus Christ so that we may break through that veil and get what God wants for us on childlikeness. I told Brother Helm this morning I thought I'd preach on childlike faith and it made him very happy. He knows how important that is, and he has a chapter. I'm going to read a paragraph in closing, the Lord helping. He has a chapter, chapter number eight. And you know what's entitled? Childlike faith. It has to do with that pony and how God got that pony to him. And it is, to me, one of the greatest chapters in any book of all times. Well, not only is humility a characteristic of childlike faith, but something else is, is a characteristic. I've called it confidence in a higher power. A child has confidence in his dad or his mother. He recognizes that they're more powerful than he is. He recognizes they have a greater degree of control. False. So the faith level is kept up because the love level is kept up. You lose confidence in each other because you lose your love for each other. Unless you're totally bad, and I've never preached total depravity, as some theologians have. Unless you're totally bad, and I know we're nothing without God, but I also know we're made in the image of God and there's inherent worth, intrinsic worth within each other. Then there's no good reason why we can't have confidence toward every person over something. And there's a lot of reasons why we can have a lot of confidence in each other. Listen, folks. <laughs> Before Papa really found Jesus, because of his disappointment and because who he really was was hidden on the inside, it wasn't, it wasn't always manifest as to why you could have confidence in Papa. But Jesus said, love Papa. And that love got a hold of him. And it covered a multitude of faults. Now I know Papa is an admirable person anyway. There's many things to appreciate him for down through life. But we didn't know that Paul, Paul was anything like he was till he found Jesus. 
Love covered faults and love did something else. It opened up a beautiful personality and brought this beautiful 74-year-old man to us. And could you tell what a wonderful person he was? Couldn't you tell what a tremendous person Papa was? This is Betty's father from uh, Margate, Florida. Oh, he was, oh, he was, well, I tell you, you just never know that at one time that you couldn't, you just never knew that he wasn't a man of love because he exercised such love. You didn't know that he was such a magnificent personality. He called me last night. Oh, Marlene, I'm telling you about this. Thank you, sir. I heard he asked for your telephone number. Now, in all carefulness, I want to say that the, the, who Papa really was was so much hidden that sometimes you couldn't see anything but hardness on the outside. But God helped Betty and Flossie and Becky and the boys to love Him and the girls who, who loved Jesus, the ladies who loved Jesus, it, it broke through that thing. Why, he, he thinks Flossie, you know the old saying, he thinks Flossie hangs the moon. He thinks he hung the moon. He thinks Betty does. It's a beautiful sight. I was privileged to see him take Betty in, in uh, his arms and that hasn't been his custom all of his life. She's not known that at all. Isn't this great? So talking about faith and this love relationship. It just seems like to me that whether or not it's evident, evident at all, we ought to be exercising faith toward one. Remember what Brother Helm said? Act like everybody's in victory whether they are or they aren't. And I've had people tell me, that drew me in. <laughs> Chase Hill told me that. Well, I'm supposed to act like that. I don't know what's going on all inside inside Chase. All I knew is that, his, that who he was and his being here told me that he was hungry for God. So I'm to act like he's in victory. He is in victory, but I acted like it when he didn't think he was. <laughs> Chase and I have gotten close together. Closer together, we travel back home. And Billy and Barbara room together as they stayed down there this week, and we've gotten close together as brothers in the Lord. And there's a, even a greater degree of confidence. But you know something? Isn't it wonderful that Jesus gave me spiritualized David as He did you to know that this man was called to be a man of God and had within him secrets of the kingdom yet to open up, which are now opening up tremendously and wonderfully. See, it's great. Talk to Brother Helm about him at 2 o'clock this morning. I tell you, Brother Helm was excited about Chase Hill. It's Chase right down here. Chase, stick your hand up there so they'll know who I'm talking about right here. And who would have ever thought that you'd have got Chase from the back seat to the front? See, you just, or anybody else for that matter. I tried to tell you, David and Brother Boston and uh, Marie and Sister Boston, I tried to tell you that the church should feel from the front to the back. And it's you know, pretty well filled all the way. But it's really something because most of these folk, most everybody in here would like to be on the front seat. And there are just a few. There's going to be more front seats over here, but th that's not going to work. You know, there's just so many around there. Back to my original thought. Isn't it wonderful to have love and confidence? See, it's not a misplaced confidence. If I may use myself first, I deserve that confidence and that faith. Now, I'm not saying this in myself. But Chase deserves that. Billy deserves that. Barbara deserves that. You deserve that. And furthermore, you know it. Without carnal confidence, you know good and well that if everything is right, <laughs> you know God loves you. And he has confidence in you. But all oh, what it does for God's love to reach out through a wife or a husband or children or a pastor or whoever it is and just have confidence in you no matter how thick the battle is. They love you and have confidence in you and they know by God's grace that this love relationship will help the good to win out. Well, what, what do you think's made me? <laughs> oh, Jesus help me. So I can say this. Without embarrassment. A halfway good preacher. <laughs> I'm not a good preacher. But I'll tell you one thing. You get in front of people like this and you'll be a good one after a while. Why? Because the love and the confidence draws it right in. Furthermore, love covers them all two faults. 
I'm not worthy to be here at all. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I need Jesus Christ every day, every minute, every moment. I'm just crying out all the time. Oh God, forgive me. Oh God, I plead the blood. I'm, I, need, I need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I've been saved and sanctified, but found out that sanctification didn't make me an angel. I found out that I still had to deny self, and that after a few hundred hours of prayers, there's something else in there that needed to come out. And these people love me anyway. Well, that'll make, that'll make a pretty good preacher out of a person. See, it's already helping me when I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Pulling me right out by God's wonderful grace. See, it's a tremendous thing for you to love like that. Can that love ever be misplaced? I think not. Bill, Deal, where are you? Bill said that that continued love drew him back. I've never lost confidence in this man. Even when he was away from God, I never lost confidence in him. Where's Pam at? I never lost confidence in her. And Steve noticed that through the years. Well, I know there's something wonderful about Pam. I know there's a hunger in her heart for God. And I know it's true for Bill. And I know they're called of God. And I know that when they're in any service, the kingdom of God is stirred in a wonderful way. Well, you know what they said? It got them back in here. I said to somebody in counseling the other day, I said, I want, I want you to tell me something. Are you the most troubled or is he your, your companion? They said, I am. I said, I knew you wouldn't lie to me. That's tremendous. Now, I'm full well aware that most people who are away from God and in the life of sin will lie outside. Certain, but I tell you, when you're in an attitude of love and confidence, you don't want to lie. See, it's a tremendous thing what this does. And Jesus said, this kind of person shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Any other kind will not. Well, a high degree of love. In God, our relationships are kept clear as to the nature of God. And He will do all things for our good. I've got an example here when I was writing these notes about Buck Perry. And the example was <laughs> the love that's coming through Pastor Steve. And how he got his pastor down here and how he's told him about all this congregation. Boy, God's doing a wonderful thing in that relationship. And that, that love and that confidence in Buck's coming true, you see. You know, I said, Buck, you come on up here. We'll be happy to foot your expenses. And he was shaking his head because, you know, he's a wealthy man. But that's what we're supposed to do if he comes up here. And wouldn't it be wonderful to have Buck Perry in this... In this... Yes, Say, I told you something about him. Yes, he's been hurt over his wife being lost. Will you think any less of him because he's felt that way? Yes, then, then why aren't we as kind toward each other after one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, eight year, nine year, ten year? The reason we can be this way toward Buck is because he's a stranger. But you deserve that much from me right now, Raymond. And everyone, whether backsliding or reclaimed. It's a tremendous thing. I tell you, we need Jesus very, very much. Well, I'll go on with two more things and then I'll come to the conclusion. A child has a high degree of expectancy. Do you notice that in chapter 8 when Brother Helm expected that pony? Now a high degree of expectancy makes declaration and preparation. It says, I've got a promise. And Jesus is going to do it. And it makes preparation. Remember when he saw that pony? That pony belonged to somebody else. But he said, somehow I knew in my heart that Queen belonged to me. He said, I discovered we cannot have faith unless we have love. For faith works and lives by love, as the Bible tells us in the, in the fifth chapter of Galatians. And then he goes on to tell about the high degree of expectancy that he had and how he got ready for Queen and how he cleaned out the barn. And Dad came home and said uh, to Mother, Mother, who told him that he was going to get that pony? It disturbed him. Because he's telling everybody that my pony, my pony's coming. And he cleared the trail and, and got things ready and got it all cleaned up. Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to read how highly expectant he was. Our faith should be highly expectant today. I had one little promise at the first of the year, but it was a great promise for me that God would give me victory in 1979. And I've been riding on the promise ever since. When I was with the Bostons, I said on March 21st, 
I said, you know, God gave me a promise on January the 1st, and while I was talking, the Holy Spirit witnessed again. I promise you victory in 79. Well, I just got so happy I didn't know what to do. And folks could hardly understand what I was happy about. Well, I had a promise. And I was taking God at His Word and hanging on to that promise with everything I had. I was really happy about it, you see. Then on July 15th in St. Louis, Jesus said, I'm going to give you victory in 79. And it made me so happy. Boy, then when I said Abraham believed God, it was accounted to them righteousness, and he staggered not at the promise of unbelief. I was all around everywhere telling people about it. It was helping me very much. Your wife was there. Just as she's here right now. Jesus was helping us that night by God's wonderful grace because I was excited about the promises of God. And I was excited about this childlike faith. Now, I'm going to read to a paragraph in closing, but I want to tell you one more thing about this. These are things I just wrote down as I thought of them. Now listen to this. A child has a low or no awareness of the impossibilities. When you grow up, I'm sorry to say, the impossibilities loom large. But a child has a low or no awareness of the impossibilities. Now Charles Wesley caught that when he wrote in one of his hymns, Faith, mighty faith, the promise sees. And looks to that alone, laughs at impossibilities, and cries, it shall be done. I've seen some fantastic examples, examples in the lives of those who are childlike. They're sitting here in this, in this house today. There are wives in here that I've seen the impossible come to pass. There are husbands I've seen the impossible come to pass. There's young people that I've seen the impossible come to pass. While I had the Bostons out at the house yesterday, I, I showed them this gift that was given to me by Mary Hannah and John, you know, where Don Quixote runs around. And you know, to try to get ready for the same sermon today, I just went and read one chapter in Don Quixote. And I got all inspired. I was inspired with that man who had a childlike faith. I tell you, if I had the obstacles that Don Quixote had, I'd never get on that old horse. You know, yet if I had the faith that Don Quixote had, whether he was a bit deranged or not, I'd attack every enemy in sight. <laughs> you know what chapter I got in today? He's all the time misunderstanding things and here comes some priests robed in black and they had... Uh, Mary, you know, and they had a ritual to bring rain. Well, it's probably half pagan, but he didn't know it was a religious ritual and he thought they had his lady and that they were carting his lady off. They had their faces covered and he figured they were trying to hide and they, was, and they were, you know, dishonest people because their faces were hit. So he jumped on his horse. He was lying flat over some kind of encounter already. Jumped on his horse and headed for these monks as hard as he could go, you know. Gave all that high sounding stuff and boy, Sancho saw him going. Sancho said, I got to get with him. He's in trouble here. And boy, here they went. Man, and they attacked those fellas. It was a sight. And I think they all fled and he saved his lady. <laughs> no, I think I remember they flattened him and they took him back to his village. <laughs> It's the end of book one and book two, you know, is getting ready. A Cervantes, it's a tremendous thing. The pure heart of Cervantes. And, and, and if, if nothing else, Cervantes is saying, I believe there ought to be a faith like this in the world. But he said, I can tell you one thing, there's no room for it in this world. There's no room for this kind of love. There's no room for this kind of purity and this kind of motivation. Well, let me tell you something, folks. We better make room for it. Because our Jesus walked this earth, our Lord and Savior, in humility and childlikeness, never having on His way, always doing the will of His Father, and humbly depended upon Almighty God. Did not grasp at His equality, at His place, at the second person of the Trinity, and He was crucified. Really, there was no place. But it did find a place. It did lodge in a few hearts. And out of that came the church of the living God. Well, what are some examples in closing? I think Samuel Morris is an example of childlike faith. Don't you? Yes. <laughs> he, saw, he saw that light when he was about to be killed and he followed that light to the only free piece of territory in Africa at that time. Well, it took childlike faith. You can stick a light in front of a lot of people, but they're not going to follow it. But he had a tender heart and he knew what that light was and made his way across the rivers and as the crocodiles would come up, they would come only within the, the shadows, never getting in the light because it protected Samuel all the way. 
Oh, think of the childlike faith he had when he saw the ocean. Why, the teacher that he asked to tell me more about the Holy Spirit, she said, he, she said, well, I don't know. I've told you everything I know. And he said, he said, well, tell me somebody that can tell me. She said, Stephen Merritt in New York. Now, he was on the other side of the ocean. He said, well, where's Stephen Merritt? I've got to get to him. She said, he's that way. So he took off and he got to the ocean and he jumped in and he started swimming. Impossibility? No. He knew there was a God. He knew there was a God in his heart and in the sky to get him there some way. Because he was washed ashore again and again and again. Finally, a pirate ship uh, anchored there. And he, and he stood, and when he saw that he couldn't swim this uh, ocean, this river, that he couldn't see the other shore, got on his knees and said, Now, Jesus, you promised me, Holy Spirit, you promised me that you'd take me to someone that could tell me more about you. And when the, when the pirate captain came aboard, he kicked Sammy Morse. But Sammy said, You will take me to New York. And he did. Took Sammy aboard, and the ship was converted. Oh, it's such a wonderful story. Such a tremendous story how he came to America and found out more about the Holy Spirit. But he knew more than most anybody I've ever met in his childlike faith. So childlike that when he would look up to pray and say, Our Father, the Holy Ghost would fall on a given congregation. Oh, it's a tremendous thing. Sammy. I had a little experience in Helsinki. And it brought me clear out of my seat to preach. I was so excited because I realized that once upon a time I had a childlike faith. You'll have to judge as to whether I still have that or not. My only desire is to retain it or to recapture it. And I remembered this, that when we went to, um, went to Knoxville, Tennessee and Otis left all of his plans and needed that bid in in 1969, that I in confidence went to God's servant and said, could you pray over, could you pray over what the the bid might be, well, of course, Brother Ham could have gotten Otis into awful trouble. Because if he'd have said the building's 100000 he would have gotten the bid and gone broke. They were, at that time, Becco was on the borderline financially anyway, as they shared with me, thinking maybe of getting into another business. So think of the childlike faith that God had given me. That I walked up and said, I found a man that walks with God, and it could be that God could tell him what that... Well, he didn't know anything about concrete. He didn't know anything about steel. He didn't know anything about pricing. He didn't know anything about this or that the other. But he knew Jesus knew it all. Hey, what kind of faith does he have, folks? Childlike. And so I said, oh, brother, Ham, Otis has come down here with us, and he's left that bed. Oh, dear me. What are we going to do? Brother Ham, could you pray? Could it be that Jesus will tell you what that bed should be? He said, tell Otis to put down a range of figures where the possibilities are. Took his pen. We were together one night. I think Otis will be with us tonight. Took his pen and started through the figures. When he got to 385,000, Holy Spirit said, that's what the bid should be. So Otis calls his bid in to the office. It upsets the secretary so much that later she quits. Now, you know, it's pretty shocking to people. Doing business like that. You don't want to hold that to your heart. That's a long time ago. But uh, it's an upset thing. But I'll tell you, by God's grace, Terry put it down. All right, Dad, if that's what the bid is, how in the world you got that? But we'll just put in a $385,000 bid. When Otis got home, you're a cost man. You work for Becco. He added it all up and added the, pro the right margin for profit. And what do you think it was? 385000 if I remember correctly. Childlike faith. That stirred me so much in Helsinki, it made me preach one of the best sermons I've ever preached. Boy, I jumped all over the place. Just think God got a hold of me in Helsinki and I preached on childlike faith. I'm so thankful God helped me in a wonderful way to preach on that. Well, there's wonderful rewards for this. In closing, I just want to read two things. One from Joseph Parker. It's so great that I didn't want to write it down. I just want to tell you who it came from, one of the great preachers of all time, and finish with a paragraph here. He said, with reference to this same kind of subject, and the child's spirit being trustful. Listen to this. He said, the child's spirit is trustful. It nestles, it hugs, it clings to, it depends upon, it is wholly simple in confidence. How then is it with our hearts? Are we wise and prudent? Or are we babes? Because the result of this child likeness is that God reveals things unto babes, not unto the wise. That's one of the results. God's best things are hidden from our mere cleverness. Oh, folks, don't miss this. 
Revelation is not the result of an intellectual process. It is the reward of a moral condition. We must be far humble, so far humble as to accept the doctrine that we never conquer spiritual truth by intellectual cleverness. It is the lowly heart that reaps the harvest of this sunny field. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Cleverness troubles itself with definitions, controversies, verbal consistencies, and subtle distinctions. The heart knows nothing of all this mischief. Oh, that's good, that's David. Good, David. <laughs> oh, I just trust you weren't thinking of something else when I read that. That's why I had to read it. That's too great. That's too great for me to write down and just read it to you and tell you who said it. We're not saved by the head. We're saved by the heart. The heart waits upon God. The heart waits for God. The heart asks only vital questions. The heart utters only vital prayers. God will spare no revelation from love. If any man love me, said Christ, I will manifest myself to him. And if any man love me, God will love him. Love is answered by love. Cleverness is confounded by omniscience. If we be clever in God's sight, he blinds us with the wisdom we would foolishly imitate. To this man will look, the man that is of a humble and contrite heart and who trembleth at my word. In 1 Corinthians 2.9 says that it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But they are revealed by the Spirit and revealed unto babes. My final sharing in conclusion is from that 8th chapter. I think it's one of the greatest things that I've ever seen in prep. Over the years, you remember as he approached the door where the pony was behind, his father asked him to get out and he was sleepy and peevish. And when his father said, son, would you like to open the door? And he said, no. Then he said, son, you open the door. And he jumped out and opened the door. And behind that door was the pony, the desire of his heart, the very thing he had declared and prepared for. So that's the background. I'm reading the last part of the chapter. Over the years, I've often thought about that evening when I was riding, peevish and sleepy. My father asked me if I would like to get out and open the door. I was hesitant and not really wanting to respond, but back of that door was the very thing I desired. My father's kindly request for obedience was lovingly taking me toward that which I had long expected, for which I had prayed and trusted. Yet because of my human weakness, I did not want to open it when the opportunity came. In a similar way, Many people miss the very thing for which they have prayed and trusted because they hesitate to obey God's gentle command. For He only requests us, He does not coerce us. Instead of responding with joy when the Holy Spirit prompts them, they either ignore the leading or begrudge the effort to open the door. If there is something, and here it is, if there is something you want very much, keep trusting for it. Be prepared when you come to the door of opportunity. Listen to your father's voice when he speaks. Hop right down from your comfortable corner and push back the obstacles. Don't let the bumps of misunderstanding and struggle in this life lull you to sleep. In this spiritual slumber, you won't move for God and do what he says. But as you persevere upon the way of trust and praise, you'll be alert and able to know you are near the goal. I never saw it till I read it this morning. As you persevere by the way of trust and grace, you'll be alert and able to know when you are near the goal. Oh, that helped me very much. Do you know that when the pony arrived that day, my father gave a check for the complete price of it? The very day my queen came, she had, that was her name, she had been purchased in full for me by my father. Sometime there will come a day when that very thing for which you've been trusting so long is right here and is yours, all you have to do is to continue trusting and believing. Your Father has provided all that you need. You will receive it after a while. Don't press to get it. It will come in time as you let Him bring it to pass. A number of persons serve Jesus in order to receive certain things which they secretly desire. But the Lord will bring to the trusting heart everything that He needs as He serves God only for Himself. Childlike faith. May I say one more thing in closing? If the message was not for you, 
Were you willing to work with me and pray and plead the blood for whoever it was for? Or could it be that you didn't know it was for you? Whatever. It is vital. It is central. And it is of utmost importance and we can't get to heaven without it. So may the Lord help us to press to hear and to start on that path to becoming childlike. I don't know any other way to go. What are you going to do when you don't have the ability to make it? What are you going to do when the goal seems to elude you so often and so much? What are you going to do when things come crashing in? What are you going to do when the devil shows you the impossibilities as he did the ten who could not believe when they were going into Canaan? Well, you're going to have to not look at the impossibilities. Have a low or no awareness of them just at him whose nature is to never fail in his promises. And when we do, we're on our way, maybe almost there, to receiving what God wants for us. Whether it's in job, whether it's in mate, whether it's in vocation or avocation or something that's been deeply needed for a long, long while. God knows. And we simply need to trust Him. Some of you are broken hearted here today. Don't you know that God is going to mend that broken heart? Some of you are disappointed here today. Don't you know that He's going to take away that disappointment? Say, how do you know that, Pastor? I know Jesus. I know what God's like. But in the process of coming to that goal, He's doing a wonderful thing with us if we're childlike in faith and in trust. Let us stand for prayer. Jesus, You've been working with me for 41 years. And even this morning, I'm able to detect that my anointing and my manner of speaking has to do with something that's very important. So I thank you for a congregation that's willing to listen and to press and to believe. I thank you for the, the service and preparation. I thank you for your love and your grace. And I pray this morning, somehow, you reveal to us the importance of the message and the importance of our being at this place. The importance of everyone being called and gathered in this place at one time. Father, I love Thee. I want to thank Thee that during the Lord's Prayer it was this, if I could, would look into heaven and be able to see You nod Your head in affirmation and in love. How much it helped me when I did. I cannot come to thee but as a child. There's no other way to approach for thou art great and thou art everything. In these closing moments I pray that the light of God will shine through especially to those hearts that have pressed so hard to hear me this morning. It always is necessary if I'm preaching on trust or preaching on the blood or preaching on the cross. May God have mercy on our hearts and our souls this day. For we need thee so very much to trust thee as a child. And you will never fail us. In God's name we pray. Amen. Amen.